the book of Exodus under the series titled The Journey. And uh, we come this morning to uh, a, a section that we've entitled Rebel, Rebel. We'll be looking at Exodus chapters 32 and 33, 1 to 6. So if you've got a Bible, it'd be really helpful if you've got that open in front of you. Just before Easter, I was taking some lessons in a primary school. We were thinking about the events of Holy Week, and the children were were finding out the significance, some of them for the first time, of the remarkable events leading up to the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. And one of those events that we thought about was Peter's denial of Jesus. You remember Jesus had predicted that Simon Peter, one of his closest friends, who'd, who'd pledged undying allegiance, would deny even knowing Jesus three times. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. I wonder if we sometimes read accounts like that and find ourselves thinking, how how could he have done that? How how could he be so foolish, so so disloyal? And perhaps we look at other well-known Bible stories and ask similar questions. How could Jonah have been so foolish as to try and run away from God? Why did David let him be, tells himself be tempted into adultery with Bathsheba. There are, there are probably all sorts of other examples that come to mind. Examples of God's people letting God down, giving into sin, being disobedient and unfaithful. Well, we shouldn't be surprised, should we? The Bible makes it very clear in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not just Peter, not just Jonah, not just David, all the Israelites, we all face the same battle. We're all infected by sin and so want to do things that please ourselves instead of pleasing God. And Aaron refers to that in verse 22 of our passage this morning. He says, you know how prone these people are to evil. And the truth is, so are we. Prone in the sense that that's our natural inclination. It's inevitable. So, So when we read this account of the golden calf, we may possibly find ourselves saying, how could they be so stupid? And yet we are the fools if we think we are immune from such sin. The truth is that we are never far away from impatience, from idolatry, and from immorality too. So this passage provides us with a stern warning and crucially a way forward as well. To my mind, the big idea of this passage is everyone is prone to sin. Christ alone can atone for sin. Let's remind ourselves of this story that David's read for us and that we're focusing on this morning. Let's get the story really fixed in our minds. Moses had already made a journey up the mountain to meet with God. He'd returned with the Ten Commandments and other laws to guide the people in living lives that would be pleasing to God. And the people enthusiastically endorsed their commitment to everything God required of them at first. Well, their mouths did. But what about their hearts? You see, the next time Moses went up the mountain, God gave him his plans for the tabernacle, as Miles reminded us last week, that that portable place for the presence of God as they traveled. Moses was was there on a 40-day, 40-night training course, just under six weeks. Not Not a long time in the grand scheme of things, but it seems too long for those left behind. Aaron had been left in charge. And when the people's patience grew thin, they surrounded him and set out their demands. Give us a God, they said. Moses is out of sight. We want something else to focus on. So was the peer pressure too great for Aaron? Was his memory too short? Was his newfound power and responsibility too much? Aaron asked for all the gold earrings of the women and children and melted them down and molded them into the shape of a calf. This was to be their new God. An altar was built and a party planned. 
The people offered sacrifices and then offered themselves to each other in drunken debauchery. From a distance, God was all too aware of the dreadful scene unfolding below. He made Moses aware of their miserable state, saying, They've been quick to turn away from me and my commands. Well, God sees everything. Their outward disobedience and their inner immorality. God's anger burns at their sin and his holiness demands that they be destroyed. But Moses intervenes. He intercedes, he prays, he pleads that God's glory be seen in a miracle of mercy by sparing the sinners. So did God change his mind? Did Moses get his own way? Was God's plan superseded by the will of a man? God's mind has always been to show mercy. Moses, the man of God, made a case for God's mercy prevail. Moses wanted to see what God's will always planned to show. Moses makes his way down the mountain, bearing the tablets in his arms. How his heart must have sunk and his face must have fallen when he saw the idolatry and immorality. In a fit of anger, he breaks the tablets in a vivid demonstration of what the people had already displayed. God's law was broken, deeply, deeply broken. Moses' man handles the calf into the fire, watches it melt and makes a powder that he mixes with water and makes the people drink. And he then turned aside to his brother Aaron. Aaron's explanation and excuses were feeble, fail and foolish. They demanded gods. They rejected you. So I did what they wanted. I asked for their gold, threw it into the fire, and just look what came out. A calf. Moses had had enough. It was time for decisive action. Those who were committed to the Lord were to stand alongside Moses. All the Levites did just that and were given the sobering task of ridding the camp of 3,000 ringleaders of the rebellious people. Sin is serious. Its consequences are costly. But despite the severity of the response, the problem was far from resolved. Sin is serious. Moses makes that clear the very next day as he says to the remaining people, you have committed a great sin. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And then in an astonishing display of selflessness, Moses offers to sacrifice his status and security, his place among the people of God in return for their forgiveness. It may have been an astonishing offer, but it was not acceptable to God. Moses, the man, is unable to pay the price. God sends the people on their way to the promised land, but they must go now without his presence. The penny is beginning to drop for the people about the severity of their sin. And they're left wondering whether God's presence will ever return. Can anyone right the terrible wrongs they have done? Can anyone restore their broken relationship with God? That's our story this morning. And let's walk together a little more slowly through it and see what it has to show us about ourselves and even more importantly than that, what it shows us about God. So firstly, looking at verses 1 to 24, I want us to see some symptoms of eye disease. Over the years, you may have heard some simple definitions of sin. Perhaps you were told sin is spelled S-I-N because I am always at the center Similarly, I once heard sin described as a form of eye disease. What I want is more important than what God wants, and I act accordingly. Well, as we see the people of Israel spiraling down into sin, I think we see three symptoms, all of which also just happen to start with the letter I. It's important to acknowledge that these are symptoms. They're 
the outward evidence of sinful hearts because sin, first and foremost, is not what we do say or think. It's the way that we are. Selfish, proud, ungodly. Did you spot the three symptoms? Their impatience, idolatry, and immorality. Now, of course, these aren't the only forms that sin can take, but they're some of the ones that we see here in this passage. Firstly, there's impatience. We see that in verse 1, where it says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, Moses was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. We know that from verse 18 of chapter 24. Just under six weeks. Not a long time. The length of the school summer holidays. The amount of time that's gone by since we had that heavy snowfall at the beginning of March. The length of time that's gone by since the start of the Salisbury spy saga. Six weeks. Forty days, give or take. Not a long time. Remember that Moses was on an extremely important mission. He'd gone to meet with God on Mount Sinai, having already received the Ten Commandments and now receiving the instructions on how to build the tabernacle where God's presence would dwell. This was crucially important for the future of the people and their journey to the Promised Land. But the people grew restless and impatient and and sought to take matters into their own hands. Just a matter of weeks previously, In 24, verse 7, the people had said, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. That's what came out of their mouths. But what was going on in their hearts? Their impatience led to idolatry. Rather than waiting for God, they rushed to find something or someone else to fill the void. More accurately, they put themselves in the driving seat. They jettison the first two commandments and they make their own plans. They fashion for themselves an idol, something to take the place of God, but it would be powerless and so not stand in the way of them doing what they wanted. And their desires, their pleasures are soon in evidence as they eat, drink, and indulge in revelry. The slippery slope is very short when we replace God's will with our wants. When instead of seeking to please God, we selfishly please ourselves. One obvious form that that can take is immorality. It's interesting that The Apostle Paul refers to this in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in a section the NIV entitles Warnings from Israel's History, in verses 7 and 8, Paul writes, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, and then quotes verse 6 from Exodus 32. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie, and then it continues saying we should not commit sexual morality. I think that refers to a different occasion, but, but the thoughts here are clearly linked. And all of this is because the people grew impatient with God. They did not grasp that God's timing is always perfect. The whole Bible is testimony that God rewards Those who put their faith in him, those who are prepared to wait for him. If we're not careful, impatience can lead us into sin too. Do we sometimes become impatient with God and and take matters into our own hands when, when perhaps that prayer doesn't seem to be answered? When instead of waiting for Mr. Right, we risk a relationship with Mr. Wrong. When we want our reward here and now instead of in heaven. Patience does pay off, you know. Ten days or so ago, we were in South Wales on the Gower Peninsula. It's a relaxing time for us as a family, and we'd only planned to do one or two things while we were there. 
The two things were to walk along the beach at Rossilli and secondly, to visit Three Cliffs Bay. See, back in 2007, Three Cliffs Bay had been voted runner-up in ITV's Britain's Favourite View competition. And it became one of those places that I decided that's, that's somewhere that I'd really like to visit at some point. So we got up early on one of the few sunny days in the week after Easter, and having parked the car in a small village, we set off following the signs. And I have to admit, the walk was much longer than I'd imagined. We went along a river and through some woods and into a shallow valley, across marshy grassland and through sand dunes, and still no sign of the sea. We kept on going, glancing up at the ruins of the castle on the hillside and, and a heron wading nearby. I'm not sure how long we were walking, but eventually we caught sight of a pebble bank. Up on the hillside, we could see camper vans and people looking out across the bay. Their view was fixed on what was just round the corner from us. And when we finally turned that corner, we saw the view that we wanted. Even the photo doesn't quite capture how amazing the view was. It more than lived up to my hopes and expectations. The view was wonderful. So after nearly 11 years' wait and a long walk, the wait, we decided, was worth it. Our patience paid off. God has promised amazing things for us. Things that are more wonderful than we can imagine. And we are foolish if we doubt his promises and provision and impatiently run after other things. Verse 8 reminds us that the Israelites were quick to turn away from God and what he commands. I wonder, are we guilty of something similar? Our impatience with God may not have led us to idolatry, uh, uh, immorality or idolatry. Ours may have been a more subtle turning away from what God has said. Our motto verse as a church this year is, Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. Have you heard God's voice in re recent months? Have you hardened your heart? What has God said to you? Have you followed it through or been quick to turn away? Has God convicted you of, of some sin? Have you dealt with it? Have you turned away from it? Have you repented of it and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or has God highlighted a habit that you're involved with that you shouldn't be? Has God highlighted a good deed that you should be involved with, but you haven't yet responded? Has God challenged you to give to some worthy cause, and yet you haven't yet acted on it? James 1, 23 to 24, very familiar New Testament verse to us. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. That's what the Israelites have done in this section of God's word. I wonder, have we done something similar? We may not have fashioned a golden calf, but perhaps other idols have deflected us away from God. What are the things that dominate your thoughts, that fill your conversations, that shape your choices? Is it a relationship, a business venture, our bank balance, our image, our leisure pursuits? We need to be careful. Before long, these idols can cause us to live in ways that compromise our commitment to God. By the way, also be on the lookout or be on the listen out for the way we often try to justify our sin. If it wasn't so sad and serious, we could almost laugh at the feebleness of Aaron's attempts to explain away the golden calf. 
in verses 23 and 24. I, I, that, that there was a sort of, of knowing chuckle when we got to that part in the, in, in, in the reading. Out came this calf. We need to be very careful if we find ourselves speaking defensively, deflecting blame for our behavior away from ourselves onto others or onto our circumstances. If we choose to take control over our lives, take that control away from God, we must be prepared to take responsibility for that too. And this passage also makes it abundantly clear that there are always consequences for sin. In verse 19, we read about Moses breaking the stone tablets. It's a vivid visual aid reminding us that sin is breaking God's law. But we'll see shortly that it's also fundamentally breaking our relationship with God. God is a holy God, a pure God. He cannot tolerate sin. He must judge it. The title that I was given for this morning was Rebel Rebel, borrowing the title of a 70s pop song which points to the rebel Israelites and the rebel in each of us too. But God is referred to elsewhere in scripture, Isaiah chapter 6, as holy, holy, holy. He is more righteous, more pure, more good than we can possibly imagine And in the face of sin, he's a God of wrath and judgment. So we shouldn't be surprised that our sin separates us from God, breaks our relationship with him. Secondly, in verses 25 to 35, I want us to see about what this passage says about commitment, consequences, and Christ. Moses has already sought to counter the Israelites' sin through, through something else, beginning with I. In verses 11 to 14, Moses pleads with God. Moses is involved with intercession. He pleads with God to withhold his righteous judgment on the people. You know, this verse causes a problem for some people who, who gets distracted by, by what they see as an instance of of. of of is God changing his mind? Is God relenting? One translation even has God repenting. But I think that's a red herring. I think this passage teaches us, these verses teach us, that prayer makes a difference. Part of God's plan is for the prayers of his people to be a vital part of achieving his purposes. We could say we all have a part to pray. God says in verse 10, leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. But Moses refuses to leave God alone. He pleads, he prays for God to show mercy. Are we praying, people? Part of God's plan for David and family that we've met this morning, where God has placed them, is that we should be praying for them so that God's mercy may be seen amongst the people that they serve. And God wants us to pray too for those people we know who at the moment have turned away from him, who are prone to evil, caught up in idolatry or immorality, and so are objects of God's wrath. We ought to be praying that God would show them mercy too. But Moses doesn't stop at intercession As well as pleading with God, he pleads with the people and calls for renewed commitment. Look at verse 26. He says, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And the Levites respond with enthusiasm. And Moses gets them to deal decisively with sin in the camp. Verse 28 tells us that 3,000 are killed. Again, the consequences of sin we see here are always costly. But what are the consequences for the remaining Israelites? Because there there could be as many as two million Israelites still gathered in this group. Well, look at verse 30. The next day, Moses said to the remaining people, You have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. 
Moses tentatively suggests he might be able to make atonement. Now, that may or may not be a word you're familiar with. To make atonement is to do what is necessary to put something wrong right. The wrong here, obviously, is sin. And that sin has broken the relationship between the people and God. Now, we've said already that God is holy and cannot allow sin into his presence. So for the relationship to be restored, the sin needs to be done away with. The act of bringing separated parties back together again, enabling the two to become one, is what the Bible refers to as at one moment or atonement. Moses offers, verse 32, to sacrificially forfeit his relationship with God in order for them to be forgiven. And whilst his sacrificial spirit is commendable, God sees sin as even more serious than that. You see, for all of Moses' qualities and strengths, he's a sinner too. The only possible solution would be for a sinless person to step in as substitute. It would be some 15 centuries later that God's sinless substitute would step into our world. Hebrews 2 verse 17 says this, Christ became human so that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Just as God told Moses to go down from the mountain to address the Israelites' sin, so God sent his son Jesus from heaven to deal with sin once and for all. The Apostle Paul in Romans 3.25 writes, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Who can atone for sin? Who is the only sinless person ever? Back to our big idea, everyone is prone to sin. Christ alone can atone for sin. So Moses cannot take away the sin of his people. And so the consequences of their sinful impatience, idolatry and immorality are still a live issue as we move into chapter 33. And in fact, new consequences of that sin are still coming to light as the people are struck with a plague in verse 35. But the worst is yet to come. Thirdly, a promise kept but presence removed. God tells Moses to lead the people onwards to the land he has promised them. The land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. But look at verse 3 of chapter 33. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. God is threatening to withhold his presence from them on the journey forward. They've chosen to live without reference to God's word and in a disobedience to him, and so they will have to continue without his presence. So we are left with a cliffhanger. Or thinking back to Three Cliffs Bay, perhaps three cliffhangers. Will God's presence be restored to the Israelites? Will someone be able to make atonement for the Israelites' sin? Has someone made atonement for our sin? Well, we'll see the answer to the first two questions next Sunday, unless you read ahead in the meantime. But most importantly, and hopefully you've grasped already this morning, that the third question, who has made atonement for our sin, that question's been answered for us. For in the glorious good news of the gospel, we find that God's presence is restored. Believing Christians are able to be at one with God once more through the mediator who is able to fit the bill, not Moses, but Jesus, who took our sin upon himself, died in our place to bring us to God. 
So those events of Holy Week that I shared with those children, those events that are still fresh in our minds with Easter just behind us, those are the events that led up to the cross, led to the sacrifice of atonement, led to the act that was necessary to put sin, the wrong of humanity, right. My question for you this morning is, do you know the reality of that in your life? Do you know your relationship with God restored through the saving death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross? Let's pray together. Father, this is a challenging passage. And it may well be that you've highlighted this morning sin in our lives. Lord, help us to turn away from sin and turn to Christ for forgiveness. Maybe some of us struggle with impatience. In your grace, would you help us to wait for you to act in your perfect timing? Maybe we've heard God's word in recent weeks or recent months, but it's been put on one side. We've quickly turned away. Lord, help us to renew our commitment and our desire to act on what you have said to us. Maybe there are some who are here this morning who are unbelievers, who don't yet know Christ's salvation. Lord, would you stir their hearts to seek mercy, forgiveness, and a restored relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're believers here this morning, as we've been reminded of the seriousness of sin, may we rejoice in the wonder of our salvation and the lengths that you were willing to go to to send your son to bring us back into a relationship with you. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Amen.